It is my pleasure to introduce this dynamic and very talented group of women who will serve as our panelists today. Our first panelist is Gretchen Jamison, and as I introduce you, you can come on up to the stage. Gretchen has invested her career leading organizations from potential to possible. Her leadership vision focuses on developing individuals and systems to discover, achieve, and advocate their distinctive purposes for themselves, for others, and by extension, for the greater good. Gretchen serves as Chief Learning Officer and Group President at Kesmeric Enterprises, a privately held portfolio of companies with interests in the industrial, automotive, sports, entertainment, and philanthropic sectors. Previously, she was Senior Vice President <coughs> pardon me, for Strategy and University Affairs at Concordia University in both Wisconsin and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Gretchen is an active volunteer and serves on the boards of several organizations focused on issues of education, poverty, and global outreach. She and her husband have two daughters. Our next panelist is Nubian Simmons, owner and president of The Pink Bakery. Nubian considers herself the uncrowned queen of inclusion. As the owner of The Pink Bakery, which is the first premium top allergen-free baking mix company in the US, she's been featured on local, national, and worldwide media platforms for her unique ability to make delicious baking mixes and frostings without the top allergens. The company uses only organic, certified gluten-free and non-GMO ingredients produced in the first black-owned certified top allergen-free facility in the state of Wisconsin. She's an SBA Emerging Leader graduate, a Beyonce Be Good Impact Fund recipient, and a James Beard Foundation Investment Fund winner. Nubian moved home to Milwaukee during the pandemic and loves being close to family. Our next panelist is Nina Johnson. Senior Vice President, Wisconsin Consumer, and Business Banking Market Leader of U.S. Bank. Nina leads commercial and business banking for U.S. Bank's Wisconsin market, managing around 400 employees in the southeastern part of the state of Wisconsin. She was hired to create a bank of the future experience using digital solutions that result in a positive customer experience within the area. Nina has worked in the banking industry for more than 35 years and has held several leadership roles in her tenure, ranging from computer operations and consumer lending to direct auto finance and private label loss mitigation. She has an MBA in global management and is the author of a 2015 book entitled Recession, I'm Not Participating, a book about the 2008 Great Recession from a Christian perspective. She has served on more than 40 nonprofit boards, committees, and consortiums in areas including healthcare, housing, and education. Nina is a wife and mother of two sons, ages 22 and 15. Our final panelist is Sha Liu, CFO of WEC Energy Corp. Sha began her role as Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer and member of the Office of the Chair in June of 2020. In this role, she has overall responsibility for the company's strategic and long-range financial planning, corporate forecasting, budgeting, treasury, accounting, tax, insurance, risk management, and investor relations functions. She joined WEC Energy Group from Centerpoint Energy, where she served as Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer since 2019. Shah is Chair of the Finance and Audit Committee on the Board of Directors for PACT, a nonprofit international development organization that works to improve the lives of those challenged by poverty. She and her husband have two sons. And our final panel, panel moderator, Kathy Thornton Bias, President and CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Milwaukee. Kathy is the 15th president and CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Milwaukee and the first female CEO to lead the club since its founding in 1887. Her operation has more than 550 full and part-time staff and over 2,700 volunteers. Kathy not only leads the largest youth serving agency in Wisconsin, but she's also the CEO of the largest Boys and Girls Club agency in the U.S. With a $30 million operating budget, 
55 trustees in 45 locations, her groundbreaking model for workforce development and career readiness has become a model for addressing the workforce shortage in southeastern Wisconsin. Prior to her sector switch, Kathy was an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial retail executive with more than 30 years of multi-channel experience, ranging from Fortune 500 companies, PE ownership and startups, all with direct P&L and management leadership responsibility. Please welcome Kathy Thornton Bias. Hi. Well, um, to the audience, um, welcome to the panel, um, moving forward and taking action in a time of disruption, or as my grandma would call it, um, if you are walking through hell, you should keep walking. <laughs> so um, this is a very complex topic, I would say, and um, so I thought about breaking it into two parts. Let's start with the first part of our assignment, which is moving forward in a time of disruption. Now, before we get started, I'm going to put a challenge out. Um, every time you hear the C word, COVID, <laughs> every time someone says that word, I'm gonna put a dollar in a jar to donate to the Boys and Girls Club. <laughs> so every time I hear the C word, Lisa Manvilla, where are you? Keep count, thank you. We're gonna put a dollar in the jar. All right? Okay, so moving forward in a time of disruption. Um, ladies, I don't know your stance on social media, um, but I have to tell you, compared to everybody else's posts, um, I'm a mess. Um, according to fake book, I mean Facebook, um, everyone is out here like living their best life. And am I missing something? Um, how are you all doing? And, and what toll has the current disruption taken on you? I'll start with uh, you, Shaw. Thank you so much. And first of all, thank you, Kathy and Dan, for having me here. I think uh, I tell both of you that I start my morning reading biz, biz time, Milwaukee. So thank you for the news you put out there. I think, Kathy, um, for me, it's um, um, interesting. I took the job at the CFO of WEC Energy Group June 1, 2020. So right in the middle of the pandemic, I moved from uh, directly from Houston, Texas. So you could imagine uh, moving to a new city in the middle of the pandemic and finding a place to live and there's no restaurants open right during that time. So, uh, so how do you move forward? I think um, you know, fortunately WEC Energy is a very, very welcoming company. So uh, colleagues reach out to me and we tried to learn about the city. We went out and we you know, we took, took advantage of the nice nature that city offers. So um, work-wise, I uh, just came up with ideas like coffee with Shaw sessions that we get a small group of employees together online and we have our coffee in our hands, but we're all sitting in our own uh, workplace. So, you know, we did things differently just to try to, to keep the connection building, especially for me as a new leader for the, uh, for the company. So it's been interesting for sure. I like coffee with Shaw. I'd like to have coffee with Shaw. I'd like to have coffee okay. with Kathy. Yeah, right. let's do it. Um, so Nina, what about you? How, how are you doing? What toll has this taken on, on you and your life? Thank you for the question. So just thinking back um, and listening to Shah's uh, reflection, I'm going to go back to when I started at U.S. Bank on the heels of being on the regulatory side of banking. Um, that was my last stint of having some exposure in a different uh, uh, genre of, of business. And so once I moved over to U.S. Bank, I was saying yes to going back to the sales aspect of banking. Um, did not know in 2019 I was preparing a entire market for a pandemic. I didn't say the C word. And so with that, I, I knew that, <laughs> um, and so I knew that I, I needed to make sure that we were not, um, you know, becoming stagnant. 
um, not just me, but the people that I was responsible for. And I think for all people leaders, you you find that you know your servant leader. At, that, at least that's the way I call it. You, you know, for me, is being a servant leader. You think about your team first, then yourself last. And so when the pa- pandemic hit, it was also <laughs> coupled with the social unrest situation right here in Wisconsin, which I talked about earlier. And I really to your point, Shaw, I had to put on my creative hat and innovation kicked in. Social media was not a burden. It turned into an asset and a resource. And so things that I did uh, with my team was to impact um, a robust um, kind of team that was charged with making sure that things that we were doing in the community uh, that were now virtual were captured in some respect, but then also uh, you know, trying to make sure that there was a cohesiveness happening within not just my team, but also the business lines that I worked with. In US Bank, we have a one US Bank mantra, and so each business line leader works together to try to build a bridge and weave a pattern of social, you know, social uh, support for our communities. And so with that, um, my focus was to make sure that initiatives were happening, even though we didn't have the face-to-face opportunity to make sure output was occurring. So things such as, uh, for example, Freighter Hospital, and I believe somebody from Freighter is here, so I'm on Freighter's board, that's one of my, my boards uh, that I serve on, and uh, people forgot about healthcare workers at the beginning of the pandemic, and these individuals were working day and night. So just paying for Um, a burrito day for every freighted worker in all of the campuses. That was something done behind the scenes, but it was something that we could post on social media to say, hey, we're not forgetting about our healthcare workers, and if you want to join in, please do so because they need you. Um, So just becoming a a conduit of, of, you know, just goodwill using social media to do so was a way that we were able to support output in the community and then internally hosting quarterly events with uh, guest speakers like, uh, you know, celebrities, uh, Chris Gardner, the the person who the book uh, Pursuit of Happiness is founded by, just having quarterly speakers talk to my market about the importance of doing great things. Katrina Cravey talking about the importance of having a personality in front of a screen and how to do it the right way. Those were the things that we did to, to support our team. Yeah, thank you for that. Nubian, how are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> how are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> well, first let me say COVID, 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 right? <laughs> Oh, Let's get you some money. I set Let's myself money. up for that. Yeah, we should. We should. Okay. <laughs> so there was four. Kobe, 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 Kobe. Okay. Um, so I will say this. Um, I I am from Milwaukee. I moved to Memphis and started the Pink Bakery there, and I was doing really well. So well that we said, let's find our own um, facility there. Let's build it. Because we, we looked for all these um, different buildings and things just weren't working out, right? And I'm a big science person. So I kept hearing no, right? But I also don't give up, right? So I was like, okay, that just means not that way. And so after like the hundredth no um, of looking at all these different properties, we finally got some land under contract. And I was like, yes. I had three parcels of land I'm going to build, right? So a week before my closing, we get our environmental test results back that says the land is toxic, which means that's a no, right? So I'm, and before we get the results, I said, if this doesn't work out, I don't think I'm supposed to finish this leg here in Memphis. I think I may have to go somewhere else. Where is the Pink Bakery's home, right? And so I get that no, I'm depressed. I'm depressed. And then COVID hits a week later. And I'm like, God, what is going on? I'm trying to juggle all these balls and I'm dropping them all, right? I went into a depression because I wanted my space so bad because I knew of the impact of the Pink Bakery and all the people that we could help if we could just have a larger space. I could hire more people. We could help more people in the community and also worldwide with with our desserts. And so my mom was like, she was so tired of me crying. And she was like, come home. And I said, I don't want to come home. Because again, I'm from Milwaukee. And with all the social unrest that was happening all over the country, I knew my city also. As a black woman, again, I know my city. And so I didn't want to come back here. Um, I was scared to actually come back here because I didn't know how people were going to receive me in this new capacity. And so I came home 
we found a place in the Miller Valley, which was a blessing because I think that was like the second time I came here looking, where again in Memphis, it was three years, you know? So that was confirmation for me that I was on the right path. Um, and then not only that, Milwaukee has embraced me and the Pink Bakery in ways I could have never even thought of. I mean, again, I'm up here, you know? Um, and so it went from being such a terrible thing um, initially, me thinking that it was because I had left my market that I had was so established with and had to come to a new place where even though I'm from here, I didn't really know this place. Um, and so now we have a, a partnership with Marquette University. They purchased our baking mixes. That would have never happened if I wouldn't have left. Again, like just all these wonderful things happened because of COVID. I got closer with my family, which- Sorry, what word? I'm sorry? To oh, COVID. COVID. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, COVID. <laughs> I, um, I got closer with my family, which, you know, I didn't even know I needed that. And so the, the beautiful thing about COVID, too, is that, um, you know, we didn't really know what it was at first. And so I was scared. I wanted to be close to my family because if, if anybody was going to pass, I at least wanted to be there for those moments. You know what I mean? Um, and, and not be in a whole other state. And so, you know, getting to be around family was is just it was more than I even know that I needed. So I'm glad it happened. You know, unfortunately, all those things that, you know, all the negative things that came from it, there were so many beautiful things that also came from it, so. We're gonna get to that question okay. as well. Okay. Miss <laughs> Gretchen, how are you doing? How am I doing? Well, how's everybody doing? It's wonderful to see so many faces, and thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. And inviting us to have this important conversation, right, around disruption. So it's, it's, it's fun to play things. It's actually tough to play things. I'm pretty last here on the lineup. You know, you asked about social media. You, you were candid with us and said you're you're a hot mess. And he's like, right? Okay, right? That compare despair is a real thing. And in social, I see how it's not being held there. So I think that's that's legitimate. When I think we face massive change, one of the first things we need to do is to build up that sense of, of belief. I remember early, early on in the pandemic, I was at Concordia at the time, and we had to shut an entire campus within a matter of a week, right? Um, Dr. Barr, you came to late. And I posted a post on Facebook, literally in my office with my head in my hands, and I decided to go ahead and post it. Mm. A colleague was it. And I decided to go ahead and post it with the statement of, to do right now. Um, so social media can be both a blessing and a curse. Um, but I think one of the things that it allows us to do in a moment of change, if we can get past that compare despair, is to use it to storytell and invite other people in to build up our own sense of belief and our belief in our networks that we influence. And every single one of you women and men in this room have a circle of influence. And I think one of the first steps of moving out of disruption and toward innovation is to think about your own capacity to create change and to have belief. Um, so that was how social media became sort of a, a fun solace place for me instead of a place of just, oh, I can't keep up yeah. during that time of tremendous disruption. So Gretchen, I'm gonna stay with you and, and include the panelists. Um, it's March 15th, 2020. You're sitting at your desk. Your head is in your hands. What, what do you think, like, what's your first thought? And then, what's your first action? Mm. It's the day before the doomsday where we're all sent home. <laughs> what's your first thought and what's your first action? Mm. So, have any of you taken the Clifton strengths out there so you kind of know what your natural inclinations are? And sometimes we have to resist those. <laughs> um, but I'm a strategic achiever, so my first gut reaction was, what can I, what can I do? Right, what, what can I do right now? Which was helpful, because again, we had to shutter a campus. And, but my, honestly, my first thought was, was genuinely about, about our people. And, and I too, like many of you, made a career move in the midst of the pandemic, right? So what, if everything's tossed up in the air, we might as well add some more balls. But in that moment, on that day, it was, what can I do? Where can I take some strategic action but also how can I do that on behalf of? And I think that is, 
that's a lesson for us as leaders and influencers when we can take that perspective outside of ourselves and to understand what can I do in this moment that benefits someone else, blesses someone else, tends to help create a, an initial path through the water, yeah. I, I think. So how about all of you? Yeah. I think our mics a are newbie and same question. I think. March 15th, you're sitting at the bakery in Memphis. What's your first thought? What are your first actions? Um, first, <coughs> on, okay. Um, first thoughts were, okay, again, like, oh my God, you know, what, what is going on? How do you, how do you navigate that? You know, I, and, you know, and when I got my MBA, you know, you learned about macro, you know, things happening and never did I ever learn about a pandemic, you know, like this happening. And so it was like, they don't do teach do? that in school, right? <laughs> They don't teach that in school. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm sure it's in the books now. Yes. Um, but it's like, what do you do? How do you handle that? Because, again, like we were dealing with um, supply chain issues um, where if I ordered an ingredient, normally it would take, you know, with Amazon, you know, about two, three days to get it. Well, now it's like two months. And it's like, I can't, you know, keep my business going, you know, off of that. We make custom cakes, you know. And so, um Again, the first thing was, oh, my God, and then there were tears, and then it was, like, just kind of laying there, and then it was, okay, I have to get up, though. Like, you know, I have to figure out what to do, and then I'm also looking to social media to see if there were other people who were trying to figure it out, too, because, again, as business owners, and, again, we use all organic ingredients, you know, premium stuff, so this is not just your commodity type things. You know, these are specialty items, and... How do I get this stuff? What are y'all doing? What are you doing with your cheese boards? You know, like what's what's going on? You know, how do we not the move cheese forward? boards? <laughs> <laughs> how do we move forward? You know, and so the support of the other business owners, you know, them being a hot mess too, and us all dealing with that at the same time was so helpful because you knew you were not alone, and so that community was so important. Yeah. My mental. Yeah. Thank you for that, Nina. How about you? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a step back to the day before, because the day before, I was at a conference in Reno, flying back to Wisconsin, and I was sitting across from someone who was exhibiting the C word. Didn't know it was the C word, but I'm looking over, and I'm normally, you know, someone offers you water or something to eat. I didn't want anything from Reno to Wisconsin. I had my... I was like, this. whatever he has, I don't want it. Um, and so the day of uh, the announcement, I literally was in a board meeting at Freighter, and the medical physician, the chief medical physician, was walking through the symptoms of COVID, and I said, that's what that guy had last night on the plane. He had, he had the COVID. Yeah. You said it. Did I say it? Yes. I was a Freudian slip, sorry. So I owe you a dollar. Um, so, so when I realized that this was really something that was happening and it was something that was going to shut down everything, uh, right away I started to think about the people leaders who had to be in front of customers. And then I started thinking about the customers. And, you know, at that time, uh, there was no such thing as having like Boise barriers and teller windows and plexiglass. Um, but I took my, pri uh, my project manager and turned him into a facilities leader. Um, and we found uh, uh, local vendors to provide us with everything that we needed from plexiglass to cover the teller windows so that my team would not have to be faced with anything that was going to make them sick. Um, we found local vendors to create, to hand make sanitizer <laughs> from a uh, provider who was near the airport who uh, repurposed his distillery. Um, it was locally made. It was you know something that I knew we could get quickly because our corporate center had run out of sanitizer. I found a local person who could stitch um, and make their own uh, face coverings. So from that experience, it gave me an opportunity to pour into local businesses and keep them afloat because that was the other issue people weren't talking about initially. And because I was responsible for small business and retail, I wanted to make sure that our small business people, our customers, had some opportunities to stay you know, afloat. When I talked about the burrito situation at Freighter, that was through a, one of our customers as well. So, Shaw, your thoughts. I mean, you aren't even that new to the area. You just gotten here. I was in Houston, Texas in uh, March. About to take a new yeah. job here. Okay, yeah, so yeah. what was happening? 
So I was working at another utility, um, and obviously, so in, I don't know, some of you may have lived in Houston, Texas, so in the March time frame, they offer this very huge uh, rodeo, right? It lasts like a couple of weeks, and everybody comes together. They would um, just have fun, like a party time, right? For it's a, a rodeo? Rodeo, like a rodeo, consistent like cowboys rodeo. Cowboys and horses yeah, and things. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> that, that rodeo. <laughs> So I was hosting people during that time, investors and uh, board members, this and that, and all of a sudden, one day, the city made a decision, canceling everything around that. You could imagine, for a lot of people, they work all year long trying to get to these events, right? So it was a big deal. Everybody was stunned. And of course, as a utility uh, professional, your first thing is, can we still keep the lights on, right? Do we have a business disrupt, uh, disruption plan? Can we execute it? Can people close the books? You know, for the finance people, that's a big deal, right? So can we close the books working from home? Zoom, what is Zoom? You know, what is that? I don't know how to use it. I've never heard about it. So those things all came in mind. Of course, you wanted to keep people safe and what's the mass policy. So I think it was a, a little bit of, um, um, scrambling for sure but I think our, our first job was to keep the lights on that's for sure like literally literally <laughs> lights, on. The lights on we appreciate you for that friend um, Sean I'm going to stay with you for a minute because we had a really interesting conversation about you know obviously we've been out of the office many of us for a long time now we're coming back to the office and dare I say, um, work remote policies are becoming almost a human rights issue. Like it is a highly volatile topic for a lot of companies. And so I'm wondering, coming you know, out of pandemic, can I say pandemic? Yes, out of the pandemic, not COVID, out of the pandemic, tell us about how you, um, as a leader, as an organization approached returning to work and what have you learned, if anything, in sort of the early days of, of what a transition back into your offices looks like? How are you all handling that? How are you handling that? It's a very good question, something we're still learning about and still experimenting. So we've had, uh, I can't even uh, remember, rounds and rounds of conversations about providing the flexibility to employees and make sure they're safe. So that's always the top, uh, top on the list. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, as we transition out of COVID, uh, the pandemic, yeah, I wanted to say that word. Uh, um, so how do you make sure the culture of the corporation is still there, right? So when everybody is working from home, especially new kids who graduated from college, they don't have any experience working with a large team in an office setting. How do you make sure they know who WEC is, what we stand for, what are the values, and how do they watch people, uh, learn from watching people, right? Not just listening on, uh, on I mean, and it applies to me. I, as a new, um, a new leader for the organization, I need to think about it from a personal level. So I think we, we made the decision to, to have a hybrid model. So we have a group of employees, especially those who are in the field, they really haven't done anything different. They're still visiting the customers' homes. They're still trying to fix the power lines. And so those, in, those employees will continue to do what they're doing. There's a group of employees we have a a hybrid model. So a, gr a certain group will work from home permanently. Certain group will have a hybrid model and directors and officers and above are expected to come back to the office uh, every day. If they have something going on with their family, they need to be uh, working from home one day, of course, we'll make sure that's so some flexibility, that flexibility in that. Yeah, so we're still learning. We we're not sure if it's the best model, but we're willing to uh, experiment. Yeah, thanks for that. Nina. Very similar to Shaw, we're still learning as well. Um, and we're noticing in some 
parts of the uh, country they're starting to spike again so it's it's kind of a moving target and so for us um, we we've coined the phrase <coughs> excuse me moments that matter so when you go back to work it's you know it's based on whether or not you're going to be um, needed at the office um, initially we were trying to kind of really be prescriptive and say okay you have to be there three days and you know then it was kind of like okay which three days are you going to be there because I don't want to be there the three days you're there because we don't want too many people and so it just became too much um, so moments that matter are really around the need of the customer and I don't know if you're like me but there's certain days or certain weeks where you're on back-to-back -back calls so is that really a moment that matters if you're you know, on calls from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. is, you know, it's really not impactful. Um, and for me, is specifically, if I'm traveling to different locations or at an event or something like that, that counts. So um, it, it's all contingent on the job responsibility, the job family, as well as um, the schedule for, for the week. I love the moments that matter. We're going to borrow that one. Okay. Moving in. One of the other things that I um, learned about during the pandemic was um, the health of our country and the health of our world. And so because we are all organic, all natural, um, we kind of looked at COVID, I think, a little differently than maybe some other people. And so for us, coming back into the office, we didn't leave it, actually, um, coming back into you know, again, where, where other people would say the office, we ask about where is your health? Like, what did you, what are you eating? Are you sleeping? Are you, you know what I mean? Like, because for us, we, we believe that that is very important when it comes to whether, if you get COVID or not, how long you have it. I know. <laughs> okay. um, whether you get it or not, how long, you know, do you have it? Does your body recover, you know, quicker because you're more healthy or, you know, just, just, for us, again, that's our belief. And so, um, again, we, we monitor the health of, of all of us. Um, and so we've been okay. Gretchen, may I pivot with you? Well, sure. Because you had this really great comment when we met. Um, you said something like, when we think about great disruption, there's so many different levels and sort of components to that puzzle. It's not just a linear idea. It's actually a multi-dimensional idea. Can you tell the audience a little bit about that perspective and what are these pieces to disruption? Because sometimes we you know, present it as this homogeneous idea and it's truly much more complex to that. So can you break that down for us a little bit this morning? <laughs> can I have another cup of coffee, please? <laughs> um, Sure, and, and it actually pertains to this conversation. It, does, it, it really does. does. So let me, let me start with this. When, one of the gifts of COVID, I'll match your dollar, Kathy. How's that? Okay, since I said it, I'll, okay. Um, one of the gifts is that it invites us to center on people, I think, in ways that were simply uh, what great organizations were already doing before the pandemic, right? When we center things on people, great things happen, right? Our mission is in our hearts, not our hallways necessarily. And that, that requires more from those of us who are people leaders. It requires a different, le different level. Um, but when we think about disruption and disruptive activity and catalytic disruption, right, and what that feels like, that's happening at a variety of lev levels, self and system, right? And so I think, I'm trying to draw back what I said that day, but I, th I think when we think about how this pertains to how we frame it with our people, um, to really be person-centered, relationally centered, to think about what's good for the individual will then feed the system. People are the first product of any of our systems. And so to be creating spaces that honor the dignity and worth of that individual in a way that also meets the dignity and worth of the mission we're called to lead in all of our organizations, that's that sort of kind of dual part of disruption and innovation. I think that's maybe getting at what we talked about. But oh, self sure. and system, people and place, right? And, and I think the key for us, so we, we began the work of the Kasmeric Center for Human Performance in the middle of all of this. So, so starting a new culture, what are we gonna do? Is it gonna be high flex? Are we gonna have everyone in their seats? What are, what are we going to do with this? And it is an organization based on the premise of potential made possible, helping people flourish and live their best life. 
we better practice what we preach. Right. But one thing that is, I think, key in all of this, and whatever the model becomes, is that we value people not just because of what they produce, but because of who they are, right? I'm not just investing in you as a colleague because I want your task, but I want you to be a part of the team and I want your brain. <laughs> and so figuring out how to do that in a way that centers people and unleashes their creativity is what's gonna power us through the next disruption, because there will be a next. There will be a next. Probably gonna be here by the time this breakfast is over. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Um, so I'm going to play on that theme a little bit, Gretchen, and uh, put back a question that you, you asked to me. Are you a disruptor or are you being disrupted? So ladies, think about that. Mm -hmm. Are you a disruptor or are you being disrupted? So this was in our conversation. I said, yeah, right? You have a choice. Every, everything in life is about choices, right? You always have choices. And, and maybe it depends on the context for some of us. But the question I posed to the group, are, are you a disruptor or are you just being disrupted, right? And, and I, I don't like to follow rules. I like to make the rules, but, but. You don't um, say, you don't say, Gretchen. You don't say. But I, I think it is that matter of, of choice, right? And that, that draws from a lot of personal attributes that all of us carry, our own sense of efficacy, our, our self-esteem, our self-belief. A lot of that, the answer to that question is pretty deeply layered for every individual in this room. But I would challenge us to think about when faced with these innovative opportunities, these chopportunities, to ask yourself that question. Am I, am I being disrupted? Am I being acted upon? Or do I have this agency, right, to become a disruptor and to shape the narrative? That's a powerful place to, to perform, yeah. I think. For sure. So, Nubian. I, I, I remember a quote you said, which was basically, listen, in entrepreneurship, disruption is part of the job. <laughs> it is maybe the job. Right. So are you a disruptor or are you being disrupted or maybe something in the middle? Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's a little bit of both because I think when you get disrupted, um, it pulls something out of you to see if you can then be the disruptor, right? So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, but yes, entrepreneurship is, is a whole nother world. It's a whole nother beast. But I, I would say that um, it has helped me to learn more about myself, you know, and see how strong I really am and how great of a problem solver I am. Um, again, you know, now I can run circles around a pandemic because, you know, we experienced it. So, um, yeah, but I think, it's, I think it's a little bit of both. And Nina, you, um, I think you have a personal mantra around pressing forward. I've heard that about you. So are you a disruptor or being disrupted? So I have to echo um, my fellow panelists here because what you just said is exactly what I was thinking. I really believe that all of us, um, if we're moving forward, many times it's because something has shaken to move us forward. And I really believe the pandemic did that for many people. It disrupted us so that we could become disruptors, so that we could reimagine how we do life, whatever that looks like. And so for me, that showed up in multiple ways. It showed up at work, it showed up at home, it showed up at, you know, um, you know with my kids and them you know, trying to finish school. It showed up in multiple uh, avenues and uh, through that, it allowed me to realize that, okay, there's not just one way to accomplish a thing. Exactly. And, and you know, you talked about social media earlier. There's a group of people that felt like, okay, oh my gosh, I don't, you know, know what to do with, you know, social media. Um, and then the pandemic happened, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, I need social media. I'll tell you another story. So my mom, who is 85 years young, um, she actually is a college graduate of Marion University, 2015. She brought, she was the magna cum laude graduate and lifelong dreamer who, you know, brought that to fruition late in life. She was all of that and did not have Wi-Fi in her home. So right before the pandemic, uh, two months before, I'm like, Mom, you really should get Wi-Fi. You should get Spectrum. You're buying this new TV. Go ahead and put it in. I'll, you know, I'll cover. Don't worry about it. She's like, oh, I don't really need that. I'll keep my flip phone, blah, blah, blah. So she gets it done flip right phone. before okay. the pandemic. She's now the 
like queen of like reaching out to 100 people every morning to send inspirational uh, messages to 100 people. And every that day person. she's like, she's oh my person. gosh, I, could, I don't know what I would have done with that flip phone. I'm like, thank you, Lord. Okay, I'm done. Okay, I want to be on that group chat. I'll give her my number. Okay. And, and Shaw, what about you? Uh, I think Nina just reminded me about my up bringing. So I, w I was raised by some very strong women in my family. My grandmother taught herself to read. Uh, my mom was a, um, she's still alive, she's 85 years old, young, young, 85 years young. Um, uh, she was an accountant for four years, raised four, four children. So watching those women in my life, I think I learned to be adaptive to disruption at the same time trying to be a dis disruptor. So I would define myself as probably a little bit of both too. Um, I think the, you know, one thing I have, have always told young women and young uh, generation in, in general is to say yes to opportunities because when you see opportunity, when you see something new, it could be a challenge at the same time, it could be an opportunity for you. So before you say no, try to think hard around it. Maybe it's a career decision, it's a location you're thinking about living and anything around it. Just try to think about it. Think about the possibility to say, to say yes before you say no. And if your answer is no, fine. But at least you thought through it. So I think try to embrace the disruption so that you could become a disruptor. That is so interesting, um, Shaw, because I think part of the conversation we wanna have with, um, with you and for the audience is about taking action during a time of disruption, right? So moving forward and moving through it is one piece of the puzzle, but then what are the actions that we take? And so. Did I ever tell you guys about the time I wanted to run a half marathon? Did I tell you that story? So um, I took the action and I registered for said half marathon. Um, I bought these really expensive sneakers. They were very, very cute. Um, but the action I did not take was really understanding that you have to train. <laughs> like run, run for this half marathon. You know what a half marathon is like 13 miles? <laughs> you knew that, okay. So, you know, at some point, that 5 a.m. wake up call and the sneakers and the, that got old really quickly, like really quickly. So part of taking, you know, an action is like understanding maybe what are the tools that you need, the new things that you need to have to take the action, so I'll ask you, before you took an action in this time of disruption, what were maybe some of the, you mentioned your mom needed Wi-Fi, you know, and Zoom, and now she's like all over. What are some of the things that you felt you needed to acquire in order to take action in a time of disruption? Um, and so if it's okay, maybe I'm gonna start with you. Um, I got, really, really spiritually connected, like probably more than I ever have in my whole life. Because again, I'm like, well, I don't know how to handle all this, right? Um, and then moving from Memphis to Milwaukee during the pandemic where everything's closed and building a facility when you're waiting for permits and you know, like all these things. Um, so faith was very important for me, but also trying to network via email, right? Um, I, I looked for any and every resource I could find. And so one of those resources was Wibbick. Um, and so they, I am a client of theirs. Shout out Wendy. <laughs> yes, is she here? here. Oh, Wendy Paul. okay. Um, so, so yes, so, oh, you're, okay. <laughs> um, another one was the near west side. Um, and once I started to see that there were resources here, and again, I was apprehensive to come back here because I didn't know how I was gonna be received, but to find out that there were so many resources for African Americans, especially women, I was all over it. And so again, near West Side, Brew City Match, anything and everything I could find. So I encourage everybody that's out there, if you have an idea or you have a dream, just go ask and see who has resources because you'd be surprised what's out here and available for you. Corporations also are donating money to try to assist you in grants. So just go for it, just, just go try. 
And so I just found every resource that I could. But it was because I think because I prayed first and uh, <laughs> asked him to show me the way and to send me guides. And so he sent them. And he sent, and he will. He's good. Um, Nina, how about you? What new skills did you take up running or any? No? Okay. What new skills? Um, so I bought a bunch of different yoga pants. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I love this. <laughs> So running is this the first time we have all dressed from the waist down in a while? So far. <laughs> Do you know how hard I had to dig in my closet to find shoes that don't have laces? Go ahead, Nina. It was real. It was real. So, <laughs> and that's a funny story because I always dressed up, heels with jeans, everything. And it's like, okay, why? Um, so back to reality. Yes. So, you know, one of the skills that um, I, I found beneficial was maximizing um, Zoom. Um, not just for work, but also for staying connected with family, aging family members. Um, so, so from that perspective, um, hosting Game Night in I don't know if you're familiar with that Chicago-based organization, but having um, just fun uh, um, opportunities, not only for my personal life, but then also for team building. So instead of having a holiday party, I had a Zoom night in and uh, shipped dominoes to everybody's homes so we could fellowship and have some sense of camaraderie uh, behind the screen. So just doing things like that, um, unusually <laughs> uh, designed to keep the momentum going and keep the one uh, team uh, spirit moving forward was something that I learned quickly during the pandemic. Yeah, Gretchen, how about you? You know, it's, it's such an interesting thing. The, the pandemic um, early on, you had a lot of kind of time to yourself, right? Especially very early on at, at home, whether that was with, you know, your partner, your family, your, your roommates, whoever it might be. Um, my husband, who's here, we went on a lot of walks. We, and we, would, we actually had names for the people we would see on the rec trail because we saw the same people every day. There was silver haired lady, there was colorful shoe guy. Like we would see them every day. We just kind of got to know them a little bit. But here's the gift that that was, that in, 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 my, in my doctoral studies, I had this wonderful professor who, who gave us this advice and said, the best thing you can do, right, as a leader is to carve out this time for self-reflection, to be able to reflect, just sit and reflect. And I remember thinking, well, that sounds beautiful. Who, great. Who has time to just reflect, right? Just ruminate and reflect. The pandemic kind of forced you <laughs> to have that time. And I'll tell you what, it's the most powerful gift you can give yourself in terms of thinking about what could be next and how might I attack it and what would that look like? You know, I too, I, I thought I was going to turn my home office into this beautiful home yoga studio. I, I go to Empower Yoga and there, it lasted like three days and it was awesome for those three days. But, then, but to think and to really give yourself that pause and then to act from that rest. That, wow, what a powerful forced learning experience. Mm -hmm. And then to realize, for those of you who are in positions where you can influence systems, whether that's in your work group or your home or your corporation, we all have different levels, to realize how you can then shape systems that open that opportunity up for other people. Yeah. You know, I was very fortunate, very privileged to be in a role where I had the type of executive role where I had that kind of permission. Mm -hmm. A lot of women did not during the pandemic, our hourly laborers, our women who work in blue collar positions, our single moms, our, our individuals who had to keep striving, they didn't have time to be walking out on the trail looking at colorful shoe guy. Um, and so then you have to ask yourself when you're in those positions, I think of leadership, how can I create systems where this is something that others have dignity to experience as well because it's life giving for me and it's something that all should have the opportunity to experience in their work. Yeah, thank you for that. I, um, uh, my team who's here from Boys and Girls Clubs, hey ladies, hi. We talk um, a lot about, yeah, clap for my team, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we, we talked a lot when the safer at home order was created and we were you know, all sent home, that that idea that home is safe is a very privileged, <laughs> idea. Home is not safe for everyone. It's not safe for a lot of women. If you ask Carmen at Sojourner about the increase in domestic violence, it's not safe for kiddos. 
home is not safe for everybody. So to say that going home is safer was a really privileged perspective. And I think you make a great point, you know, Gretchen. We have to think about those things when we are making those decisions. We really do. Shaw, what do you say about this? Uh, so, you know, one of the, my favorite books is uh, titled Innovator's Dilemma. I don't know if some of us have read Wait, that. Wait, say that title again. Innovator's Dilemma. So I don't remember all the things about it. One thing I do remember from that book is in order for something to sustain is innovation, it needs to have two characteristics. One, it needs to be accessible, so mm -hmm. inexpensive. Mm -hmm. People could afford. Two, it needs to be easy for people to be able to, to understand and use, right? iPhone is an example. It's not super uh, cheap, but it's accessible to, to most of us, right? So, um, so in terms of me taking action, I keep kind of those things in mind. Like you were talking about wardrobe. So as I, we were going back to the office, I knew I needed to get back to shapes to be able to fit into my, in your work, clothes. my work clothes. Yep. So what could I do? Um, I don't want to drive every morning to a gym. So what could I do? So I kept it simple. I have a little balcony. So I have some weights in there. I have some couple of uh, yoga mats and some things. I uh, subscribe to a uh, workout uh, app. So because of that, it's easy and it's simple. It's not expensive. I've been able to consistently uh, work out every morning. So Kate and I have a had a conversation about that. Is you know the rent concept: rest, exercise, nutrition and thoughts, positive thoughts. If we practice that in a way that everybody could access to, then you, every, all of us could become better like, mentally and physically fit, so. Is there a trademark attorney in the room? <laughs> there are pearls of wisdom being dropped this morning on the stage. You guys, we need a t-shirt company. <laughs> Just put some of these things on a t-shirt. Dan, next year, okay. Um, so I want to I want to get a little personal, if that's okay, and then and we're going to get into some Q and A with the uh, with the audience. You all, you know, <laughs> I say I call you all um, a banker and a baker, and two chiefs walked into a bar, <laughs> and what, and what happens? It's a good time. Right? It's a good time. It's a good time. You all have done like amazing things, amazing things during this time of disruption. Like, I'm proud to hear and to be on this stage with you all. But sometimes when you're working at such high levels, with such high input and outputs, with such high standards, and you're gonna run up that hill regardless, there's a cost to that. There is an emotional cost, a physical cost, a mental cost. There's, there's co these things cost something. And so I'm wondering, um, in the family circle of trust here, would you be willing to share what some of these things have cost you? I'll go first. <laughs> go first, Nubia. Um, so I've been a, a serial entrepreneur for probably 20 years. But I'm 42, yeah. Well, for 20 years. And I have decided to um, put my ambition over having a family and have, getting married and missing out on you know a lot of my friends moments in life because I was so focused on what I wanted to do and my um, college 20th year um, anniversary is coming up and you know all my friends were talking about we're bringing our kids back and you know my husband and us so, and I was like dang I just been working like I don't you know I don't have any of those things you know it's not that I like I regret that but I knew that my purpose I, I felt it early that my purpose was to do something other than that and I'm mother in other ways you know what I mean and I'm a friend in other ways you know and and but that that is a sacrifice that I knew that a husband may ask me can you please not you know work 18 hours on that business that you're working on. I need you to be here, you know, and it wasn't something I wanted to do, so. Thank you for that truth. Mm -hmm. no. 
Awesome. Nina, would you like to go next? Sure. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm a recovered workaholic. Um, so, and I and I say it that are you, way. Are you really recovered, or I'm, I, it's, you know it's a work in progress? Okay. Uh, but you know I really try to manage that. And when so many things were happening simultaneously, it really pulled on that um, to a point where I had to say, wait a minute. I'm, I'm exhibiting some old traits that I'm just not enjoying. Um, and, and, you know, we were talking about marriage. Um, so my, my husband, you, you know, your spouse can balance you and call you out, you know. Like, okay, you, it's, it's 11 o'clock. Um, you got up at 6 o'clock this morning. I start my mornings with 6 o'clock prayer. So at 6 a.m., I'm on um, an international prayer call. And um, that helps me to kind of make sure that at least my day is going to start out right. It may not end on a positive note, but at least it starts there. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that balance of somebody calling you out and then you recognizing it and adjusting uh, because you are in the zone, you are focused. And, and I know a lot of tech people, they can get in the zone too. Like, it's like you get on a project and you're there until, to, you know, you complete. Um, and so for me, that's one of the things that I noticed that there was time that was consumed to get things right size that probably could have waited, but I just wanted to get it done. I just needed to check the box. My number one is Achiever, Gallup. So <laughs> I, know, I know my issues. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, you know, it, it's part of what I continue to, to monitor. And I think it's up to me to, to be the owner of that um, in different forms. So, so that's one of the things that I think that I, I lost out on was time. And that time would have been time that I could have spent reconnecting with my best friend, which I haven't talked to in six months, um, who's also a busy person, which probably isn't, that's kind of not a good situation because we both can just kind of disappear. Yeah. But you know, those are the types of things that I've noticed now kind of coming on the tail end of the people C word um, that I'm trying to really work. You can on. say it because then you're going to put the dollar in the jar. I'm oh. C C C COVID COVID COVID. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, Shaw, give us a, a tidbit of wisdom here. Um, so, like like the rest of the the panelists, I um, I've been in the uh, energy utility business for 24, 25 years, and this is my 15th role over the 25th year, oh. which means that I, that I changed jobs a lot and I moved from uh, location to location quite a bit over those years. And I, my husband and I raised two young men. So we moved as a family for many times. So you could say that's potentially a cost. Um, they didn't grow in the same house when they go to the uh, their friends' um, home, they say, oh, they're, you know, their childhood paintings are still on their wall, and, but they're, they're our home, you know, it's different, right? It's different, yeah. So uh, I think, uh, similar to everyone else's comments, I think the, you know, if you work as a unit, you know you make the decision that's best for your family situation, you grow together. So at one point, we had to make a decision to leave the boys in the same high school and there was an opportunity for me to take so we made the decision for me to commute so the cost would be i wasn't there from monday through friday when they were in high school for three and a half years so they turned out to be good kids but um you could say They're okay the boys are okay right exactly my husband uh, is doing a wonderful job. He he ended uh, with becoming a stay-home dad during that time. So there's some costs associated with the decision the family Absolutely. makes together. Gretchen, bring us home. Oh boy. Well, so my my husband and my nine-year-old daughter are here today. I wanted her to see women doing their thing and being in action. So I guess we could bring them up and ask them what the cost. <laughs> be true confessions. Um, be fun. Um, <laughs> you know, I, as an achiever, right, 
I think the cost is, for, for me, and this is just true confessions, is, is more on my internal kind of mental, um, my kindness to myself, um, realizing that I'm not going to be the Martha Stewart that I like to be, especially you should see my house at the holidays. Oh, but it's you're up till two in the morning. I call Pinterest is actually a place for guilt for, for me. Like a, 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 I make it look really cool because I feel guilty and bad that I'm not always there. So the cost is often um, presence in the typical sense. But maybe flipping that as a more healthy thing and to see it not as a cost, but as a, a different kind of investment. And I'm a different kind of mom. I'm a different kind of wife. My husband is pastor at a church of 10,000 people. I am not your typical clergy wife. Wait, are we, we're both former first ladies? Wait. What? Still am one. I mean, they're watching. They're always watching. Uh, Dan, that's another topic, Dan. <laughs> always that's a, church people? My church Lord. People. Okay. But it, you have to decide, I think, <laughs> the risk-reward um, to be a different kind of, but then to, to get okay with that up here. And for me, that's, that's often my, my cost. I think that's probably what my spouse would say, that I'm not always as kind to myself. That's been the cost, um, as I should be. Thank you all for that vulnerability. I will just add as we pivot to uh, Q&A. Um, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this little cohort is gonna be tight together. I'm, I'm imagining that. Um, my, my cost, I think, is very similar to yours in that the more intense things became, the more I took shots at myself. So um, some of my uh, colleagues uh, will say <laughs> when I'm on TV or being interviewed, I hate watching myself. I pick apart the sound of my voice. Why do you talk like this when you're on TV? <laughs> I see myself on Zoom for 12 hours a day. When did my forehead get so big? <laughs> like I, you just pick yourself apart. Yeah. Yeah. And it's unhealthy. It's really unhealthy. No one sees this. But like literally you find the one thing about yourself and you just spin, I, spin into the black hole that is like doubt, anxiety, etc. And I think the more you choose and try to be high functioning, disruptive, you know, um, balancing all the things, more things drop and that spin starts again. So I think that idea of like how do you find healthy balance in this moment is also really important. So I'll stop there, um, and we have some really, do I have these questions? I'm going to move expeditiously <laughs> through these. Um, okay, someone says, <laughs> if we text the word COVID, does that also mean that the boys in, <laughs> no seriously, if we text the word COVID, does it also mean that the Boys and Girls Club gets a donation? And the, and the person says, COVID, 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 COVID. <laughs> Thank you, and yes, the answer is yes. Thank you so very much. Um, the next question is, did Kathy, these aren't supposed to be for me, did Kathy persevere and complete the half marathon? I did. Um, I did. I did. Um, I did, I had the medal to prove it and the t-shirt. Um, and then I never ran another one after that. <laughs> um, uh, these glass ceiling breaking women, um, what are they doing to help the next generation? So we're gonna move, quick answer, quick answer, quick answer, quick answer. Next generation, I've heard you talk about it. So Sha, why don't you go first? It's the concept of paying, forward, paying it forward. So what are we doing to share our lessons learned, the mistakes we've taken, and how do we make sure that others behind us wouldn't make the same mistakes? So it takes effort and discipline to um, to pass that on. Pay it forward. Love it. You yeah. know, very similar. Um, so we got several mentees. Um, both inside of US Bank and outside. And uh, one of the things that I, I realized was that there's so many emerging leaders who really want to uh, find a mentor, find a sponsor, find somebody who can just you know pour into them. So I helped to uh, launch a program called Aspire within US Bank. Um, and it was for the Midwestern region of uh, US Bank. So women who are 
in um, lower salary grades, that's what we mm -hmm. kind of designate them as, have an opportunity to come together, um, get in clusters, talk about some real topics, and also uh, be poured into. Um, in this last first cohort of Aspire um, resulted in approximately 150 women. Nice. So, nice. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, I mentor young women who want to be bakers, um, which again is really interesting for me because I was never a baker. Um, I was a graphic designer before I became an allergen-free baker, so it's um, really cool to be able to teach them how to do, you know, what, what they aspire to do. Yeah, love it. So we've all heard that maxim, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So invite them to the table. And I think give them a seat at the table and make the seat, invite them, sit with them, welcome them. And when they come to your doorway, and some of the women who are with me today, young women who are with me today, they, I'm looking at one of them right now, you always drop what you're doing and you say, absolutely, I have time for you. Oh my gosh. Well. Um, First of all, thank you to uh, Dan and Kate and the team at BizTimes. Um, these panelists, amazing, 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 amazing. We're going to stay connected. Amazing. Um, amazing. Eh, I'll do all right. Um, I will, <laughs> I will um, leave you all with this kind of one final thought. You shared so many great silver linings from COVID. Uh, and the pandemic, and we appreciate that. Um, I send you out into the world uh, with a theme song. Um, my friend Beth Ridley, who I saw come in earlier, my college classmate, hey Beth Ridley. Um, we used to get in a lot of trouble in college, um, but there was always good music playing, right? We always had good music playing. My, my song of the moment is Beyonce, Break My Soul. If you haven't heard it, you should play it every morning for yourself because no one can break your soul. Um, if I could sing, I would sing it, because no, we won't. Kate, come take the microphone from me. It's done. <laughs> take it.